హరి కృష్ణ మహారాజ్ దాని వరకు నాన్ ప్లీజ్ అక్సెప్ట్ మై హంబుల్ అవేసన్ సార్ సార్ గోస్ టు శ్రీల ప్రభుపాత్ థ్యాంక్ యూ సో మచ్ మనోహర్ మహారాజ్ ఫర్ గివింగ్ యువర్ వాల్యుబుల్ టైమ్ అండ్ అసోసియేషన్ టు అస్ దిస్ మార్నింగ్ అండ్ అండ్ లైటింగ్ ఆన్ ద టాపిక్ ఆఫ్ శ్రీమద్ భాగతం ఐ హ్యాండ్ ఓవర్ ద కాల్ టు యూ మహారాజ్ హరే కృష్ణ Thank you. My basis is to all the devotees. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya ఆత్మనిత్యోవయాసుద్రిఘైతోర్యాపకోసాఖ్యాన్విత్యాసాద్భావ ట్రాన్స్లేషన్ ఆత్మ రిఫర్స్ టు దుప్రీం లోర్డ్ ఓర్ దివింగ్ ఎంటిటీస్ బోస్ ఆఫ్ దెమ్ ఆర్ స్పిరిచువల్ ఫ్రీ ఫ్రమ్ బర్త్ అండ్ డెత్ ఫ్రీ ఫ్రమ్ డిటీరియరేషన్ అండ్ ఫ్రీ ఫ్రమ్ డిటీరియల్ contamination they are individual they are knowers of the external body and they are foundation or shelter of everyone of everything they are free from material chains they are self illuminated they are the cause of all causes and they are all pervading they have nothing to do with the material body and therefore they are always uncovered with these transcendental qualities one who is actually learned must give up the illusionary conception of life in which one thinks i am this material body and everything in relationship with this body is my purport in the bhagavad gita 15:7 click Lord Krishna clearly says, Mamai vam so jiva loke jiva bhutana sanatana All living entities are part of me. Therefore, the living entities are qualitatively the same as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is their leader, the Supreme Lord, the Supreme among the living entities. In the Vedas, it is said, Nitya nitya nam chaitana is chaitana nam. The Lord is the chief individual living entity, the leader of the subordinate living entities. Because the living entities are parts or samples of God, their qualities are not different from those of the Supreme Lord. The living entities have the same quality as the Lord, just as a drop of seawater is composed of the same chemicals as the great sea itself. thus there is oneness in quality but a difference in quantity one can understand the supreme personality of godhead by understanding the sample the living entity because all the qualities of god exist in a minute quantity in the living entities there is oneness but god is great whereas the living entities are extremely small anor nani anor aniyam mahato mahiyam Kata, Kata Upanishads 1 to 20. The living entities are smaller than the atom, but God is greater than the greatest. Our conception of greatness may be represented by the sky because we think of the sky as being unlimitedly big. But God is bigger than the sky. Similarly, we have knowledge that the living entities are smaller than atoms. a one ten thousand the size of the tip of a hair yet the quality of being the supreme cause of all causes exists in the living entity as well as the supreme personality of god has indeed it is due to the presence of the living entity that the body exists and the body changes place body changes take place 
Similarly, because the Supreme Lord is within the universe, that the changes dictated by the material orders occur. The word ekka, meaning individual, is significant. As explained in the Bhagavad Gita 9.4, Matstani Sarvabhutani Nachaham Teshwa Rastitaha. Everything material and spiritual, including earth, water, air, fire, sky, and the living entities, exists on the platform of the spirit soul. Although everything is an emanation from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one should not think that the Supreme Lord is dependent upon anything else. Both God and the living entities are fully conscious. As the living entities, we are conscious of our bodily existence. Similarly, the Lord is conscious of the gigantic cosmic manifestation. This is confirmed in the Vedas, Yasmin Dao Prithivi Kantakrik Sam Vigyantaram Adikena Vijaniya Ekam Eva Ditya Yam Atma Jyotir Samari Ho Vacha Sarimam Lokim As Raja Satyam Gyanam Anantam Asango Yasya Purusho Purnasya Purnamadayam Purnameva Vasishyate. All these Vedic injunctions prove that both the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the minute soul or individual. One is great and the other is small. Both of them are the cause of all causes. The corporally limited and the universally unlimited. We should always remember that although we are equal to the Supreme Lord in quality, we are never equal to him in quantity. Persons with a small fund of intelligence find themselves equal in quality with God, foolishly think that they are equal in quantity also. Their intelligence is called avisuda buddhayaha, unpolished or combined or contaminated intelligence. When such persons, after endeavoring hard for many, many lives to understand their supreme call, are finally an actual knowledge of Krishna Vasudev, they surrender unto him. Vasudev Sarvamiti Sarmahatma Sadur Labaha. Thus they become great Mahatmas, perfect souls. If one is fortunate enough to understand his word, then God is great, Vibhu, where the living entity is small, Anu, he is perfect in knowledge. The individual exists in darkness when he thinks that he is the material body and that everything in relationship to the material body belongs to him. This is called a homo mo. Janasi moho yam aham mameti. This is illusion. One must give up this illusionary conception and thus become fully aware of everything. <laughs> Hmm. So here, we're hearing about the eternal constitutional position of both the Lord and the living entity and the relationship between the two, which is the principle of eternal reality. This material world exists as a punishment for the living entity. That's basically why it's there. 
And it's also there as an opportunity to rectification, as a rectification for one's deviation. Punishment is coming because of deviation. Rectification is available also within the punishment. It is like within jails, the living entity. One is put in jail for some, some deviation, some criminal activity. But the jails, some of them, at least theoretically, uh, provide some rehabilitation so a person can reform from their deviant mentality and then when they're released, they become good citizens again. So this is the material world. It has only two purposes. One, to punish the living entity for being because of its desire to be separate from the Lord and to enjoy separate from the Lord. and But it also gives one an opportunity to rectify that, when we say, discordant mentality through the process of coming back to the Lord in devotional service. Otherwise, everything we do in this material world is simply a combination of the material energy in order for the living entity to somehow try to fulfill his desire to become happy here. So that, that allowed, that's allowed also to, that, all right, you want to enjoy separate from, from the Lord? Here's a place where you can do it. There's no room for that in the spiritual kingdom. And so that desire forces one to take birth in this realm of illusion. Why is it illusion? Because Material energy is mutable. It's always changing. All the forms are always changing. The ingredients are, are eternal. The ingredients, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhumir Apanalobayu Kamano Buddha Evacha Ahankara Itiyame Bina Prakriti Astada Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego make up my separated material energy. There's nothing outside of that in this material world, and all of the forms are simply a combination of these eight elements. That's all. So whatever we see and come in contact with is made up of these eight elements, or a, a partial manifestation of these eight elements. And therefore, it's called illusion because none of these things are permanent. They're all temporary. And because the living entity is eternal, it tries to enjoy in this illusionary world and therefore it becomes frustrated. And then it ends at a certain point. And then one is forced to come back again until they get it right. Just like when you go to school in the lower grades, if you don't, if you are in the fifth grade and you don't pass, you have to go back into the fifth grade again, and before you can go to the sixth grade and complete your studies in the fifth grade before you can move to the sixth grade. So in the same way, before we can move out of this material world, we have to rectify this deviant mentality and wanted to want to enjoy separate from Krishna. And the rectification is not simply a a stoppage of that uh, that that mentality. It's simply an activity that has to bring us back, and that is the process of devotional service. So, in this particular purport, Srila Prabhupada really gets into the glories of the living entity being qualitatively one with the Supreme Lord. And this, all of this explanation helps us to understand our real identity as separate from this material identity, which we adopt when we come into this material world. It's like when you come into, a, say you're asked to play a part in a particular drama. So you are who you are, but then you're giving this part, you're giving lines that go along with the part you have to play. So you fully absorb yourself in the drama. You forget about who you are. You sort of identify with the part in the drama. And when the drama is over, you get back to your actual identity. In the same way, this material world is like this drama we play. It has no meaning. 
in the sense that it, it doesn't really give us any fulfillment. All it does, it just helps us to somehow come to the reality that I don't belong here <laughs> through the process of frustration due to, the, to the, the unfulfilled desires that the living entity can. And the ultimate unfulfilled desire is everyone wants to live eternally, but no one can live eternally in the material world. So that desire no one can fulfill unless we go back to the spiritual world and we can live in, eternally in our real identity as qualitatively one with the Lord who is also fully eternal in all aspects of his existence. Now it's interesting here, we get a little insight of, to see that all of many of the qualities of the Supreme Lord, and Prabhupada gives a very interesting statement. He says that if you want to know God, try to know yourself, because many of the qualities that you have are also there within the Supreme Lord. The only difference is the quantity is different. So in the Nectar Devotion, there's a whole long list of the 50 qualities of the living entity. And those 50 qualities are there in full in the Supreme Lord. But there are, of course, additional qualities that are mentioned in the in that in that narration, which goes to 64 qualities of the Supreme Lord, which the living entity doesn't have those additional 14 qualities. There are, some of them are there with Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma, others with Lord Narayan, but Lord Krishna is the full manifestation of those qualities. Um, but that's not mentioned here. Krishna, Prabhupada just wants to emphasize that we want to know God at least and how he acts, what is his nature, and how does he um, to relate to the living entities in the material world. A study of one's own nature is a foundation for learning that knowledge. Of course, there is additional, additional studies which add to a, a complete understanding, and that comes by uh, understanding deeper the Vedic knowledge given, especially in Srimad Bhagavatam, describing the living entities. Qualities, activities, like that in relationship to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So the idea of this particular verse is just to show who we really are and how we are outside of our normal uh, uh, say, position in relationship to the Lord. Although our identity remains the same. We have adopted a false identity, which we consider to be real. And that's the problem. A false identity means uh, whatever identities we, have, we adopt based on the body. And such as male, female, husband, wife, son, a citizen of a particular country, member of a particular club. You go, the whole list goes on and on and on. This world is so full of variety also in the identities that we adopt. And people are always changing and looking for new identities to add on to their already illusionary identity. And therefore, they compound their suffering in this material world. And that continues. Maya Ravase Kacho Bese. Kacho Hububu Dubai. Life after life, we add on something more to our present illusion, and the illusion becomes thicker. But when we come to devotional service, then we are actually getting free from the illusion and coming back to who we really are, where life is eternal, full of knowledge, and full of unlimited joy in relationship to the supreme source of our existence, the personality of Godhead, in different types of relationships that we see here in the material world. Like Prabhupada would say, you know, in the spiritual world, you see there is lover and beloved. There is also uh, lawless love, that is people who are married, but apparently have another relationship outside of that marriage. 
With Krishna in the spiritual world, that is considered the highest form of transcendental uh, happiness for the Supreme Lord and his devotees. But when we see it in the material world, as it says, the material world is simply a perverted reflection of the reality, then it becomes a source of degradation and condemnation also. And of course, uh, parent to son, friends, uh, serving different ways, all of that is there in the spiritual world with Krishna. But here, where we're, it's like it's like if you had a little child and you see, especially little girls, they want to become like their mother. So they get a little uh, dollhouse and they have a fake kitchen in there and they're cooking and they're playing with dolls and they're, they're acting like their mother, but in a very childish type of environment with just artificial paraphernalia. So that's what we're doing here. <laughs> we're doing the same thing. Here, we're simply trying to imitate what's going on in the spiritual world, but there's no substance to it here. And we just waste time and just deviate from where we should be. So then here, so again, this verse, these both verses really help one to understand that none of this material uh, show that we so much are attracted to and attached to is actually have any have any real value in relationship to our identity it's just like sometimes you go into a place in this in this world there's a thing called the uh, lunatic asylum uh, in the lunatic asylum there are people there who cannot function outside in normal life and for various reasons, because they're considered to be without any sanity. So in there, you might find people demonstrating something other than they are. Somebody says he's Jesus Christ. Someone says he's George Washington. Uh, they somehow, people identify with some great personality, and then they think that they're that person, and they act in that same way. And so these people can't function outside. So sometimes they become so de detrimental both to themselves and others. They're giving this place called a lunatic asylum, or sometimes we call it the crazy house like that. And they protect themselves from becoming worse. And at the same time, they don't do damage to the rest of the society. So it's the same thing. We're we're all somewhat in this big lunatic asylum called the material world, and we're we're falsely acting according to this adaptation that we somehow identify with. But the problem is the lunatics also think they're normal, and that we have that same thing. We think everything is just normal. It's normal if you're in the lunatic asylum and. But if you go outside, you'll find yourself not functioning. So the outside is the spiritual world. And so here, then, our real identity is being, and it's not only being mentioned, it's being glorified, that we are so close to the same qualities and activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that we are so intimately connected to Krishna, yet somehow or other we're we're not aligned and aligned in our activities therefore unless one seriously takes up devotional service and then re restructures their consciousness in relationship to their real identity which is to serve the supreme personality of god him for the pleasure of the lord and then we continue to have to come back life after life in these different costumes that were given called material bodies and playing in this role that is simply contrary to our actual identity. And uh, not only our actual identity, but our actual uh, welfare and ultimate happiness. So, um, yeah. So here is this this these two verses are really really so deep in transcendental knowledge uh, just to read it over and over again and to try to understand it more and more 
is a is a very worthy uh, uh, exercise in order for us to digest more of our who we actually are, because it says here, um, Atma, the term Atma, which is in the translation, refers to both the Supreme Lord and the living entities. Both are free from birth and death. Both are free from deterioration. And both are free from material contamination. This is another interesting point being mentioned here. We, in the material world, they say that soul becomes materially contaminated. But in one sense, that is not also true. What does that mean? It means that the contamination, again, is just a, an illusion because the soul never touches the material energy. The soul cannot blend with the material energy. So the soul cannot get contaminated. Just like there's a very, very nice verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the 10th canto, 14th chapter, which says that liberation and material bondage are both an illusion because the living entity cannot become bound up by this material energy, nor can the person be liberated from it. Because if you're not bound up, how can you be liberated? But then again, we talk about that in, in a different way to say we are bound up and we are. What is that? It's the illusion. So once we get past the illusion and come into the reality, then material contamination and liberation no longer exists for the soul because the soul is never con is never tied up by the material energy because the material energy is powerful, but the living entity is part of Krishna. And the living entity, when it connects with its part in the process of devotion, which is his actual eternal occupation to serve the Lord is our eternal occupation, not just a, an occupation that exists at one time and, don't, and doesn't exist at another. No, it's eternal. And therefore, the, because we're not functioning in that eternal occupation, we come into the illusion that I get it contaminated and I can somehow rather free myself from this contamination. So it's interesting. I mean, there's a beautiful verse. I think it's in the 14th chapter. I think it's verse number 24 of the 14th chapter that describes this. And it's actually Lord Brahma, his prayers to Lord Krishna describing that both contamination uh, or bondage, the word bondage is used, and liberation are both an illusion because the soul can never be bound up, nor can it be unbound because it is it is pure spirit and has nothing to do with anything material just like we have nothing to do with the reality of our dream -like state when we go to sleep at night we take rest and the mind works in such a way as to bring up certain um, conceptions of our existence on a subtle level but when we wake up in the next morning we pretty much forget about what we dreamt and we go on with our regular activities so this world is again like a dream it's simply the living entity is dreaming that they're whatever they are it's just a series of dreams that's all uh it's both quite ridiculous and at the same time quite pathetic because or we might say quite uh sad because the living entity is actually wasting it's it's like if somebody gives you a long a a large sum of wealth and you simply take it and you put it in a in your safe or something and you never use it so we've been the human form of life is that treasure to get back to our reality of eternal service to the Lord in the spiritual world, which is the perfection of one's, what we say, not perfection of existence, that exists already. It's the, it's the graduation out of the illusion. <laughs> That's basically what devotional service is, to graduate 
out of the illusion of misidentification. Now, it's interesting. Um, I would suggest whoever's here today listening to this class, please read this verse continuously. And if you do, let me read it over and over again, in both the purport and the translation, and you'll start to understand more about who you are and what is your real identity and where is your real, how you actually are a very powerful force of existence. The soul is very powerful, <laughs> but because its power has been checked by its illusionary concept of being the material body, it doesn't use its power. It uses its facilities simply to further the illusion, that's all. But therefore, but the soul is powerful because it's 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 connected with the supreme power, Sri Krishna. <laughs> Okay, we can stop there and open it up for discussion. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful class, Maharaj. Uh, if anybody have any questions or realizations, please unmute yourself and please go ahead. Sukar Krishna Prabhu, please go ahead, Prabhuji. You are on mute. Yeah, go ahead, Prabhu. Krishna, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Maharaj. So you told about this 10 point, 20, 14 point, 24, no? I 10 think it, point, I think 14 it's, point. It's 10 point, 14 point, 24, I think it is. Or it could be okay. 20 books, I'm not sure. You'd okay, have to okay. look at it. <laughs> it's, I think it's a very it's, wonderful point you brought. Yeah. That it is, it is not real. It is illusion, and the the, the soul never gets bondage, and uh, so it is only a drama. It is a dream. We are not living. Actually, we are dreaming. Yeah, we're dreaming, <laughs> but it's a long dream. Mm. The night dream is a short dream. The daydream is a longer dream. That's... So the class is also going the dream class. You are trying to remind us that we are sleeping. <laughs> Well, the ingredients for waking up is is the the means by which we can come back to our eternal position and wake up from the dream. So Thank you, Mother. Thank you. When we discuss these things, we're no longer we're we're getting we're we're, we're gradually waking up from the from the dream. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Seek your blessings. Yeah, thank you so much, Maharaj. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, Krishna Kavaraj Prabhuji, please go ahead, Prabhuji. Thank you very much. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you and your services. My humble obeisances to all the devotees. Guru Maharaj, you said that this material world is like a prison, and the prisoners, as such, we prisoners, we need to uh, be, we're here to be punished and we need. We're here to be corrected. Guru Maharaj, the government's prisons, the prisoners there, they know that they are in prison and they know that if they behave in a certain way, then then they, they've got a good chance of being released earlier. But so why, why is it that nobody knows they're in prison? Why is it that, that covered from them? That is called Maya, <laughs> illusionary energy. And But if we take time to reflect, um, nobody wants to get old, but we're forced to get old. Nobody wants disease, it comes. We forgot how miserable birth is, but if you... Speak to your mother, she'll tell you it's not a very 
pleasant thing. <laughs> it's very difficult, very painful. In fact, even many women lose their life at childbirth. It's one of the leading causes of death in the United States, and women dying at childbirth. It's, so it's not, and for the child, it's also not a very pleasant thing when you when you're born you don't come out dancing you come out crying <laughs> uh and of course nobody wants to, everyone wants to live forever but death is posed upon us so if we just reflect on these four miseries we can see that we are in a type of prison <laughs> which is giving us these forced punishments and we try to fulfill our desires and we can't for whatever reason. Maybe we fulfill some desires, but some other ones we can't fulfill. There's so many examples. We all have experience of unfulfilled desires or desires that were fulfilled, but no longer could, could, could give us satisfaction. So a little reflection about how the material world is working upon us will help you to understand, hey, you're in prison. <laughs> you're limited. And you might you might have you might be there's just like in a prison, there are three types of prisoners or three grades of prisoners. For instance, you have the third class prisoner who deviates and causes trouble within the jail and is given some added punishment. They call that solitary confinement, where the, the individual is placed in a very small little jail cell with no facilities at all, and they cannot go out. They have to stay there for like every day you know, for six months until their term of punishment is over within the prison, then they get back to mainstream. And the second class prisons are the mainstream prisoners, the ones that are just following the prison rule. And then you have the privileged prisoners where you have people who have been exemplary behavior within the prison and it's been noted and these persons are given pr certain privileges in the prison. I've seen it when I go into prisons of people who, who are privileged prisoners, they have some control of other prisoners. They also have access to other areas of the prison that mainstream prisoners don't have. They're trusted. <laughs> so you see that in the material world also. You see people who apparently have a somewhat free from suffering life, but they're still suffering, of course, but it's not as bad as some others. And there's others who day to day can't even get food, <laughs> who whose life are being threatened at every minute. Just look around the world. <laughs> get beyond your limited sphere of exper experience and look around. You see people a tremendous suffering. Their, their, their lives are at death. Some of them can't even find food. You know, it's, I mean, the starvation population of the world is in millions. Millions of people are starving for lack of just food, which is available for most people. So you see within the prison, there are different levels of suffering. But everyone is in the prison and everyone is undergoing some type of suffering, which means we're limited. The soul is unlimited in relationship to Krishna in devotional, in the, in the spiritual world. And it also becomes somewhat unlimited even in the material world when one becomes fully active in devotional service. And then by that connection with the supreme free, who is Krishna, he is supremely free. He's not bound by anything. Even by, even by his own rules, he's not bound by. He 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 lives completely 
uh, what we say, uh, he's called Swarat. Swarat means totally independent. We also have that quality of Swarat within us, but we are partially independent. We can never be totally. But we can also come to a level of almost totality in, in independence when we fully engage in devotional service. Mm -hmm. And we're no longer under the restrictions of material energy. And the material energy is restrictive. Mm -hmm. And you see that that great devotees can defy even the material energy and do things that normal people cannot do because they are still controlled by that same energy. When you're connected to Krishna, the more you're connected to Krishna, the more you're free. And when you're fully connected to Krishna in devotion, that means every moment, then you're you're totally free. That means there's no more death, no more disease, old age, birth, no more rebirth. Everything is is just you're almost there in the spiritual world, yeah. not quite. <laughs> You have to die to achieve the ultimate. You have to give up the body, not die. We have to give up the body to achieve the perfectional stage of of the spiritual existence. And these devotees are fully happy. They're always happy. Constantly. So there's different levels of imprisonment within the material world. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, next question, uh, Siplesh and Prabhuji. Please go ahead, Prabhuji. Unmute yourself. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. All glories to the assembled devotees. Uh, Maharaj, in the purport, it says, Yet the quality of being the supreme cause of all causes exists in the living entity as well, as in the supreme personality of Godhead. How can we living beings or living entities be the cause of all causes? I've always understood that Krishna is the cause of all causes. Yeah, when I read that, I was quite, uh, quite, uh, became quite thoughtful. How is that possible? But then you when thought I... quality was quality was same you thought. Quantity-wise, different. Yeah. Quality-wise. Yeah, that's that's the point. Quality-wise, we are the same as Krishna, and Krishna is the cause of all causes. So Sachidana. it's only in our stage of, of, of pure consciousness that we have that quality, which is in a small proportion of our existence. That's all. It's not of the same quantity as Krishna, but it's in a it's a small proportion of the that eternal quality of sarva karana karanam, cause of all causes. Krishna's infinity. Yeah. When you're yeah, when you're. In that pure consciousness, yeah, and then you're you can actually exhibit that quality to a certain degree. You can make things happen. <laughs> we observe Satchidananda, but not to his level. Uh, say that again. We also have Satchit Anand, but in smaller proportion. Yeah. He's... That's, that's the answer. It's in a small proportion, that's all. Is ocean be a drop of water? <laughs> but same water. So so it's the pure devotee who exhibits these qualities more than us beginners of Christ. Yeah. Pure devotee also is Sri Kalagyan. He knows past, present and future. Prabhupada told us so many things when he was present that later manifested in terms of, you know, and manifested in reality. The 
There's so many things he said. Prabhupada could look at you and know what you're thinking. <laughs> you couldn't hide from Prabhupada. Even if you tried to hide your thoughts, he would be able to detect them if he if he wanted to. Of course, he wasn't trying to do that with everyone, but if he if he wanted to, people would the devotees would say that when they met Prabhupada, I could see that he's seeing me beyond who I I think I am. He knows who I really am. Yeah. I even had that experience with one of my senior god brothers. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that certain things about him. He just turned around and looked at me and gave me an answer based on my thoughts. Jack. With no no communication other than what he his re, response to my thoughts. And I had met other persons who had the same experience with this same personality. That was Bhakti Tirta Swami. Yeah. He was so powerful. He 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 could detect your mentality if he wanted to. It's not like devotees make a pro a program out of trying to find out people's minds, but if it comes up and it becomes important, it becomes revealed. And so, I mean, and he still was acting within the material body, apparently, but at the same time beyond the material body. It's like, I'll give you an example. There are many people who know that just before they're going to die, they know they're going to die. Very mm. soon. Then they can chant no matter Yes. If they know they're going to die, then they can chant no nicely because then they can pass the test. Yeah. But the bodies who are very advanced, and of mm -hmm. course, even even non-devotees, sometimes they can also sense that very soon I'm going to die. There's a sense that comes. I think you might say that sense is Krishna's indication. I've seen mm -hmm. that. One senior devotee, he was talking about it even before it happened. And then it recently happened. And there's also signs. Like one very mm. senior devotee, he opened his door one time. He was in India. And he, mm. saw, a black, he saw a black snake that was right at his doorstep. Oh. And, and then he said, he, he understood, yes. And then... That does yeah, one day later he died. <laughs> so then the whole day you would have chanted no Maharaj. He knew that that has come, you would have totally chanted, no, because he knows that he had to pass the test. Yeah, so I'm just using the power of the mind it goes beyond yeah. you know, the, more, the normal reasoning understanding that we apply to the mind. Brahma, Shiva, but they can know past, present, and future. But well, waking up from sleep is the self-realization. When somebody getting self-realized means they've woken up from the dream. Well, the material dream, yeah. Mm. Self-realization means to understand who you are. Mm. But then, End you of to, dream. then you have to act. That's the next part. Uh, if you don't act on who you are, then you go back to the dream state again. <laughs> Mm. Just like we're talking about it, we're all waking up now. We're all understanding who we are. But then, when the class is over, sleep. when class is over, we go back to sleep again. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, Malach. Thank you for your answers. We'll go back to sleep. <laughs> Stay engaged in devotional service. And remember, Thank you, Maharaj. And remember Krishna. That's the whole point. Thank you, Maharaj. Just a pure devotee, if you just bless all of us, we all will become more conscious, Maharaj. 
your Prabhupada disciple. If you praise me, you'll get nowhere. Oh, Maharaj. But if you take up the process, you'll, you'll get some better. Okay. okay, Maharaj. Sorry, please excuse me, Maharaj. Don't let it happen again. <laughs> sure, Maharaj. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Ajit Prabhu, please go ahead, Prabhuji, with your question. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept it. Maharaj. Maharaj, thank you for a wonderful lecture. Maharaj, you mentioned uh, two things. Uh, one regarding that we are here in this material world because of our desires. And then you spoke about devotional service. And Maharaj, when uh, when we are performing these, malab, any sort of devotional service, uh, especially about me, I, I still uh, feel that there are desires hidden in that uh, devotional service too. Uh, uh, and those are like uh, people will say that I am doing a good service people will praise me for name and fame all all those desires are still there Maharaj how to curb our desires how to be uh, humble and how to perform devotional service with only a desire of pleasing Krishna pleasing Guru Maharaj and pleasing Vaishnavas Rupa Goswami explains what is pure devotional service and he gives that explanation so we can adopt that that mentality in performing devotional service. And so that means ridding ourselves of certain uh, motivations that come by way of activity. These motivations that come by way of activity are due to our material life. So we carry them into the spiritual activities also. We have that tendency. And so what is the what is the carrying? Well, we want to get something from the activities we perform in devotional service. We want to get some credit, some notification, some reciprocation, something, either subtle or gross. <clears throat> There's even devotees who will not serve unless they actually get some money for their service. In other words, they look at devotional service as a way to perform to fulfill their material needs also. These are all mixed forms of devotional service. So Rupa Goswami calls them fruit of activities. Fruit of activities means activities with a desired result. But devotional service is ayabila sita sunyam. It's free from all of that. That means it should be done for the pleasure of the Lord or the pleasure of the Lord's devotees and with a desire to please. That's all. That's the essence of the consciousness, to do it in a pleasing way uh, with a desire to free oneself from these, uh, these false uh, ideas that I need something to... And that's material life. Material life is fruit of work. Spiritual life is activities that are done in, in a selfless way, not looking for anything. But a devotee knows that by simply by serving the Lord, all my desires can be fulfilled automatically, simply by serving the Lord. Uh, there's two ways to fulfill a desire. One is you get rid of it, and the two is you go to a higher level of existence. Krishna consciousness is the higher level of existence. So when we act in the in pure consciousness, that yes, I have to serve. The, I'm serving the Lord for the pleasure of the Lord and for the pleasure of the Lord's devotee. That is my focus. Let me do it in the best possible way. I'm not looking for any praise, blame, rewards, presents, gifts, you know, garlands, whatever may also come. We're simply doing it as an activity. And we know because we're connected to Krishna in that service, there's no greater benefit that we can achieve. So we actually cheat ourselves when we bring in our material desires to devotional service because we can't get the full benefit of that service. Mm -hmm. 
So serve for the sake of service. We do that sometimes when we're under obligation sometimes. We, sometimes we have to do something because it has to be done. We know there's nothing in it for me, but it's still a requirement in my life. So we do that. So sometimes we can even see in the material sense that we also do something in a selfless way because it's a required obligation. That's all. It's like, okay, to, to use a very simple thing, you're busy when your wife comes and says, well, I need, I need to go someplace and I don't have a ride. Can you drive me there? And you say, oh, of course, yeah. But you're busy doing something. You give up what you're doing so you can take your wife to where she wants to go. It makes her happy and you did it. So what's in it for you? Nothing in the sense that you get the pleasure of serving your wife by doing it. So we get the pleasure of serving the Lord simply by taking on devotional service. And so, simple analogy. Thank you, Maharaj. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for wonderful answer, Maharaj. It really helps everybody. Uh, Sukar Krishna Prabhu, do you have any question? I mean, I see your hand is raised, Prabhu. Maharaj. Yeah. Maharaj, just I want to know that this uh, Mithyanka, the false ego, though we are trying to get out of that, but that is not leaving us. The Yeah, that's the most subtlest. And the most mm. hard, it's the hardest one to detect mm. because it's so subtle. The gross, the gross mistakes we made or the gross activities we perform are easily seen by ourselves and mm. by others also. But the subtle things are hard to see, the activities of the mind. And the false ego is to fulfill a certain desire based on a false sense of identity that's all so how to check that how to how to control that it's very difficult but the the best way is to just take association with devotees hmm. when you act out of your false ego in association with devotees it becomes quite noticeable <laughs> hmm. but when you're by yourself and you're in your normal situation you can't notice it, and other people may not may not even notice it either. Mm. So do what that's Yeah, that's 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 part of the solution. Even the mind also is like a monkey it jumps. You know, we try to control while chanting. It's in spite of having so much, decision, you know, desire to chant uh, completely with. You know, dhyan poor work, but it just goes off and it becomes a mechanical chanting. Uh, where's where's our Vardana? Where are you? Are you there? Yes, yes, Maharaj. You're the host, right? Yes, Maharaj. Bring up uh, Bhagavad Gita from the, uh, let's see, what chapter is that? Chanchala Himana Krishna. Where is that hmm. verse? Something is, I think it's 934. Somebody read the translation. Verse number, Prabhu. Go ahead. The mind is restless. The mind is restless, turbulent, obstinate, and very strong. O oh, Krishna, and to subdue it, I think, is more difficult than controlling the wind. Now, go to the next verse to get Krishna's answer.
the individual no lord krishna said lord krishna lord said, krishna oh. said oh mighty arms son of kunti it is undoubtedly very difficult to curb the restless mind but it is possible by suitable practice and by detachment so he gives the answer suitable practice means the process of pure devotional service and detachment means stop stop your material activities stop stop your stop being attached to your material activities. Uh, perform your material activities in a detached way that's all thank you maharaj thank you for because if you don't do that you're just feeding that restless mind that's all mm -hmm. but detaching automatically the mind also will subdue yeah, we have our material activities, but we have to detach ourselves. We do it in a detached way. That's just a requirement. Okay. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, still, anybody have any questions or you'd like to share any realizations? Amy. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Thunder Pranam, beautiful class. I have a question um, about, uh, you know, giving and taking association. Um, I mean, I have some friends and colleagues who are not in Krishna consciousness, but um, I, I do uh, have some uh, interaction with them, but with the mind that, you know, I mean, they, they may take the process as well. But what I find difficult is that um, when you are, you know, uh, dredging this, I would call it like dangerous waters, uh, you may actually get some, you know, there's a counter transference, meaning you, you, you can get uh, kind of, I don't know if contamination is the right word. You, you may get their association versus giving your association. So how to, how to kind of be, careful uh, not to you know get association from them versus your mind is that you are trying to give because as a person like for myself i'm not so grounded and not so strong that i can protect myself well first of all somebody asked well what does it mean to be in association and then the answer is affection for so you develop a certain affection for that person in that association. It's not full blown, but there is certain affection. So that, that brings about a type of association. So we say, keep your affection for those persons who are Krishna conscious or devotees and keep your relationship with those who are not routine. Routine means you carry on the business that you have to do with that person. But you don't go deeper into that relationship because as soon as you do, your value system will be threatened. And you'll start to hear things and uh, maybe even agree with things that are contrary to the, the values and the practice of Krishna consciousness. So there is, it's more like an official type of uh, interaction with, the, with people who are not devotees. Becomes official. Where with devotees becomes more affectionate and more intimate. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. You, got to, you just have to practice that and just be careful not to go beyond a certain, uh, you know, protocol mm. in, that, in that relationship. If they're going to invite you to their parties or talk about their personal life, mm. you know, you need, you need to somehow or other distance yourself from that. 
So generally, we say keep your keep your friendship with devotees. That's and then you won't find yourself in that. If you have to do business on the outside in order to maintain material activities within the family, then you know you might develop some friendly relationship with the guy who's on the in the supermarket who you see every time when you go buying some some mm. groceries. But you just keep it friendly and official. That's it. Don't talk more. Not necessary, but we need, we are social beings. That's the thing. We have to find that social outlet within mm. the society of devotees. So Maharaj, then how do we bring them to Krishna consciousness if that is something mm. we want to do? So then there, that's what you said. You said you, we have to give them our association. Mm. And we explain you know, what we're about and not so much hearing about what they're about. You might hear about what they're about in order to respond to them up to a certain point. But when they start talking about their personal life, and oh. unless you're doing it in, in a way to counsel them, in that, but if you're doing that, if it's just an equal exchange of, of ideas, then they're going to try to present their life to you as something that is important, mm -hmm. interesting, uh, something you might benefit, they, they might want to give to you. They want to share with you their personal experiences in their sense gratification activities. Like that. <laughs> That's what they usually do. Or they get into a lot of, people get into talking about things that are completely useless. They're always talking about somebody called Gramya Kata. Gramya Kata, Romantic Kata. Yeah. yeah, that's very true, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thanks so much, Maharaj. Super answers. I think nobody have any questions further, Maharaj. Um, <clears throat> anybody wants to ask any questions to Maharaj? Okay. Uh, if nobody have any questions, can we end the call here, Maharaj? You are in charge. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful class, Maharaj. We are very grateful. Thank you for today's class. Hare Krishna. Shamagari Mataji is there. Shamagari Mataji? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Maharaj, for your wonderful <coughs> class. We are very grateful to you, Maharaj, and we look forward for your association regularly in the future. Thank you so Once much. Let us stay open to Maharaj and all the businesses. Thank you, Maharaj. This is the member of businesses. All the rest. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Very wonderful class and very nice question answer. Thank you so much for Thank your you. Thank you, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much for the class. Wonderful class. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maharaj.